taking us on this four-week voyage on the Pequod with you. And uh, take it away, Judy. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. I'm going to uh, reduce my thumbnail view and uh, put uh, screen sharing on and bring up where we were. Uh, you know, I, I keep going back, you know, as you realize from before, uh, whenever I bring you back together again, I sort of do a little bit of where were we and where are we now? And, you know, I can't just let go of uh, Marcella's comment in the very first session about nibbling. And, and we found out that, that um, Queequeg was not nibbling on his idol, but he was whittling on it. And I went back to that again, and I did some word counts. There's a, uh, a version of this that is online that you can do word searches for. And in the, in the text, of, it happens in, at the beginning of chapter 10, where uh, Queequeg is, is whittling on his uh, idol, kind of working on the face there around the nose with his pen knife or, or jackknife. But when, when Marcella read that, she read it as nibbling. And I think, I know why, and it's because before this, um, Melville, Ishmael, had referred, had used the word cannibal or cannibals, um, let's see, 11 times in the first nine chapters. So as we're reading this, subconsciously, we're, there are certain words that are unusual that stick in our heads, and, and that um, influences our, how we read things. And I think that Melville's very much aware of how that could work. And it worked with me too, because I'm going to show you why I misled you last time. Um, let's go to the first lowering this time. Uh, let's see, first lowering. Here we go, first lowering. It's, it's, it, when we're reading, and I, we covered this, uh, I think two weeks, last week more than, than we, we didn't get to it the second we got to it last week. But um, you get this, this, this the, the first time they put their boats down because they've seen uh, a whale that they're going to try to capture. You've got the sound of elephants, you've got the hissing of serpents, you've got a trembling of a, like an earthquake. You get these images and they're strong. They, they overwhelm the, the rest of the narrative, I think, as we read this. And then the wind increased to a howl. We get more of this kind of animal and, and, and fury kind of thing as we're reading it. And then we get the image of a white fire upon the prairie, uh, the squall. There was a squall coming in and it roared like a white fire on the prairie. Not a red fire, a white fire. Remember, white is one of those strange and uh, re <laughs> resonant words in this whole novel. And then you get refer refers to the jaws of death and he refers to uh, a, a roar of that, of that sound around him like a flaming furnace. And then later on, the very last paragraph, floating on the waves, we saw the abandoned boat as for one instant it tossed and gaped beneath the ship's bows like a chip at the base of a cataract. That is like a, a piece of wood at the bottom of a, of a waterfall. It's being turned around. So we see that abandoned boat. And then we, uh, I'm gonna go to the last line there. The ship had given us up, but it was still cruising. If happily it might light upon some token of our perishing an oar or a lance pole. You see those two, uh, the, the two uh, highlighted uh, parts of the sentences in that last paragraph. And I, I saw those sentences that I, I thought they were important. And what I did was completely ignore. And remember last time I brought up what happened to the boat and, and uh, you know, did they, could they retrieve any parts of it or anything like that? And I, I was under the impression that the boat, because it had gone underneath the, the hull of the, of, of the, of the ship that it, and, and the, that it was no longer intact. Well, if I would have read this middle sentence that he's got sandwiched in here. After uh, we saw the abandoned boat and then the vast hull rolled over and it was seen no more till it came up weltering astern that is behind the, the big um, Pequod. Again, we swam for it, we're lashed against it. That is against uh, the, the little whale boat by the seas and we're at last taken up safely landed on board. You know, I completely overlooked that sentence because of what's around it is so um, fear inspiring, let's say, 
And, and the last thing, you know, the last sentence there, um, the ship had given us up, but was still cruising happily if it might light upon some token of our perishing and or, or a lance fall. Obviously, uh, Ishmael did not perish because he, he was able to tell us this, but sandwiched between these, these in this, this, this whole um, chapter about how severe that, that thrashing was, we get this notion that the ship did really remain intact and so they could reuse it again. Again, it was so easy and I'm not sure if, if Melville's playing with us this way or if it's just my own um, inability to pick up clues as I read things, but I, I was uh, misled by this in a way and I had to go back to it. And it was by going back that I realized that, that ship did not get ruined. It, it could be reused again. Well, Any well, comments Judy, about this? Yes. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, in reading, uh, I mean, the whole book, I got, got through to the end about half an hour ago, found out what happened. <laughs> and, uh, but so many of his paragraphs are so rich of description. Yep. Uh, you, you keep reading and it's another descriptor, another descriptor, another descriptor. It's easy to lose track of how, uh, you know, the, how many, what are the important descriptors? I mean, you could look at all of them and, uh, you know, he's just a, you know, uh, I don't know how to describe, his style is just something that I'm not used to in writing the, in reading more contemporary novels by any means. Right, he's got so many distractors. <laughs> his mind goes in so many directions. And then he often is inconc he's inconclusive. That is Ishmael it can't conclude things very well. He leaves things open, but we get so much of this and, and imagery piled on each other that, uh, and, and I, I, I'm attracted by imagery. And so I completely miss, uh, well, I overlook some of the more prosaic, um, uh, plain meanings of words that are buried right in the middle of all this richness. Well, then his vocabulary is so expansive and his uh, use of references to, you know, old writings of the Greeks and the, and the Romans that things are, you know, just, they're less familiar. And again, I mentioned before that I, spent a lot of time, you know, reading it on my iPad, tapping a word to bring up the definition just to sure. make sure that I, sure. I understood where he was going. Yeah. And, his, and, his, and his pace is unusual by our contemporary standards. He has, he, he'll have long sections where, where there's introspective kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of train of thought sort of soliloquizing. And then in the, as in this short paragraph, He's got a whole bunch of events that happen, uh, but but they're all but they're just kind of you know, whap 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 right on top of each other, still thick with you know with this uh, uh, really fascinating syntax. So it's 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 hard to keep up at points. Right, I found especially in these last chapters about the chase, there are three chapters about the three days of the chase. I found those very fast moving, and to the point where I'd have to somehow almost re force myself to reread this to get all those details to say. Who's now on board now and who's on the whale ship and did they get killed or are they still alive? That that kind of thing was and I think I think in some ways Melville's doing it so that we do have as much confusion maybe in reading this at, at the moment that as 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 the people in the in the whale boats are uh, thrown into confusion by all of the activity around them. And most it just struck me. Go ahead, Go ahead Tom. Go ahead, it ahead, just struck Mike. me as, uh, has, has there ever been a, a, a Moby Dick, the movie? Oh, yes, I think so. I'm going to look that up. Yeah. Gregory Peck. Okay. Now I'm going to have to see that. Was it in the 50s or 60s, maybe, Tom? Do you recall where you were seeing it? Um, I, I, would, I would guess right around 1960, but I don't, I don't know exactly. Okay. But by, by contemporary writing uh, patterns would be that when, when action speeds up and there's a lot of stuff going on, writers tend to slow down so that we can follow each thing and, be, and those are often important <laughs> passages and, and uh, to some extent Melville kind of turns that on its head. Right. Okay, I want to leap forward here. Uh, this, you know, when I was trying to figure out did they, once, if they lost that ship, which they didn't, would they have extra ones on board? In, in our uh, third Norton third critical edition, the, the one that was recommended but not required for this course, there are some some drawings of ships. And if you're looking at uh, the, the whole, the, the Pequod, for example, this part here that I'm going over, this is a, 
a sideways view of it and you can see where when they have oil that leaks this is where it's happening where the oil barrels are leaking in the part that we read for today there was parts a problem where the oil barrels were starting to leak and they needed to um, figure out whether the, the boat was causing that or, or patch those leaks so they, they wouldn't get get okay. worse they didn't want to lose all their all their oil to, to leaks leakage and then if you look across here, here the three boats, the forward boat would probably be the one that, that Starbuck would, would be the one in charge of. And then the next one would be the one I think where um, Stubb and then Flask and then uh, this last boat would probably be the one that Ahab would get. And you notice here that they have two spare boats on board already. So they, they're really prepared to lose up to two boats without having to uh, start remaking another one. But I, toward the end on day three, I think a lot of the crew, uh, some of the the, um, the first mate, second mate and third mate were on board uh, the, um, the Pequod because they were. Lost you, Judy. Uh-oh. Our yeah, I, that's, that's yeah, I'm seeing it, her, her camera is frozen. Yeah, she's our, our presenter's AWOL. <laughs> I'm trying messaging her a second. Oh, good call. Michael, would you like to take over? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. You're a good leader, Tom. No, not for this. Oh, um, now she's talking, but muted. Okay, Judy, you're muted. I'm, I'm okay. Now I'm not mute. Okay. You're back. And I've got everybody. I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, share it. Share screen. And I'm going to pull up the wheel. Okay, now I, I we're back together again. A little commotion there. I'm not sure what caused it, but we, we recovered. All right. <laughs> Uh, the Russians. Good, good recovery, Judy. <laughs> well, thank you. Kim helped, I think. Let's see. This is at the. Yeah, you know, we were. This is at the the castaway, I think, right in here. We, we did that last. We, we did a lot with the castaway last, last time. Yeah, right here is um, information about sperm whales. And and if you look here, I I sent you some information, uh, links to some videos, and there was a link to a blog article too about the the thinking capacity, the brain size of a sperm whale. And here you have a picture of them and you see that head, how much that head, it's like a one third of the, of the, of the, of the, the length of the, of the whale is, is in the head. And a lot of that head is where a lot of that valuable oil, uh, spermaceti and such, or are found in the head of the whales. But um, notice that the mouth is just an underslung as he's got a big overbite um, for the orthodontist in our group. And, uh, just a tiny little way, uh, bottom jaw. And the teeth are such that uh, the teeth that either come up from the bottom or have holes in the bottom there, the, the teeth uh, get get locked into holes on the top there. He has teeth only in the bottom jaw, I think are the top jaw, but not both. Um, and baby whale, a newborn whale is weighs over a ton. That gives you something about size. And um, let's see, uh, length, I did a little math with feet here. Um, almost, almost uh, uh, the, the um, in in feet, uh, a male whale could be as long as uh, 60 feet, perhaps so, you know, almost 60 feet. Um, and you see the size for the female a little bit less, uh, but uh, the weights again, um, just huge, huge in surface and in weight. Now the doubloon. And the point of the doubloon, I think, is that. Everybody has a chance to look at it, and many of them have some words that are captured, and and we get the point of view of from various people. Let me uh, just quickly summarize some of that from the book itself. I think our Ahab's is, is significant here. We're starting Ahab looks. And he says, there's something ever egotistical in mountaintops. He sees the images on the, on the doubloon, mountaintops and towers and all other grand and lofty things. Look here, three peaks as proud as Lucifer, the firm tower that is Ahab, the volcano, that is Ahab, 
the courageous, undaunted, and victorious fowl. That too is Ahab. All are Ahab. And this round gold is but the image of the rounder globe, which like a magician's glass, glass to each and every man in turn, but mirrors back his own mysterious self. Um, yeah, but it, it turns out, you know, he sees Ahab in each of those. And you know, at the end, he wanted to keep the coin to himself because of course, he of said course. he was the first one to find the fish. Right. He keeps redefining who gets to have that coin. And at the end, it goes down with him. <laughs> it's down probably somewhere <laughs> still still nailed to the mass that has been greatly uh, water sogged uh, yeah. at this point. Right. Um, but you know what? Uh, what's what's the psychological term for for this kind of uh, diction? Th this kind of uh, vocabulary? Anybody? What what would a, if he were sitting in a therapist chair? What would the therapist write in his book? Yeah, narcissist. Yeah. Narcissist, exactly. Egotistical. Narcissism. He is a total narcissist. He everything he, you know he. Anything he looks at, it mirrors back his own mysterious self, and you get that image of a Narcissus. Uh, way back in chapter one, there was the image of Narcissus uh, looking down in the water, often maybe looking down so fast and so much that he topples over into it. Uh, that that uh, that is the image that is conveyed to um, to uh, Ahab by the doubloon. Starbuck. Um, uh, hopes and and he sees sunshine in it somehow i'm just overlooking a lot of details here stub would uh look at it and said well i'm going to spend this thing that's his his idea from that he gets from it uh stub um gives it some kind of weird zodiac zodiac interpretation of the life of man and uh um king post uh another name for flask flask sees in it how much uh it will buy him in cigars uh the manx man sees a prediction of doom for the ship queequeg remember what queequeg sees when he looks at the doubloon his engravings his it's engravings queequeg uh if you get the book it's toward the bottom of 320 queequeg looks at it and he takes it for an old button off some king's trousers, a button. He doesn't even see it as a coin of, that could be spent. He sees it like a button. And then Pip, all he does is say, I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. He, he just does a, a kind of a verb conjugation. And it summarizes, I guess, that each one sees a different thing in it. Um, and, and uh, I, I, it's, it's uh, experimentation, I think, with the whole notion of point of view. Um, we, we see a number of, point of points of view that are expressed in here. And it's hard, I think, for us to imagine that Ishmael, who's the narrator, can have been present at all of the things that are told in these last chapters, especially, especially when you have a confrontation between Starbuck and Ahab, maybe in the captain's, uh, Ahab's uh, quarters even. How, how would Ishmael know that? Uh, but I think that, that Melville is playing with the fact that uh, it's a kind of a notion of relativism. That is that different people can look at the same thing and see quite different things. And I think Melville's mind was wide enough aware of that, that he, he had a little bit of that. Uh, I think he, he, he believed that was true, that not everybody see the same thing the same way. We see that later in the Gilder chapter, and we'll get to that shortly. But uh, in chapter 109, we get a confrontation of Starbuck and Ahab in the cabin. And uh, Starbuck kind of uh, knocks on the door, um, Captain Ahab not even looking up, uh, asks you know, who's there hearing the footstep, doesn't turn around, Who, he, whoever it is, be gone, be on deck. And, and then uh, Starbuck says, but Captain, you know, in effect, it's it's your first mate here. You got to listen to me. The oil in the hold is leaking. We've got to do something. We've got to we've got to get into that hold and find out what's causing that. And otherwise, we may waste all of our our, our oil. And uh, Ahab's answer: Be gone. Let it sink. And and Starbucks concerned. What are the owners going to say? And the attitude of of Ahab to the owners. Let the owners stand on Nantucket Beach and out yell the siphons. Who cares? 
they have owners, owners, thou art always prayed unto me, Starbuck, about those miserly Myers, Myers owners, as if the owners were my conscience. But look ye, the only real answer of anything is its commander. And hark ye, my conscience is this ship's keel on deck. So um, Starbuck is totally, uh, you know, uh, belittled or whatever. He, he, he has no way of, of getting to uh, getting Ahab to change his mind on that. And uh, he implores him in the next line. Uh, you can see here that uh, Starbuck, his face is all red. He's sort of embarrassed. He, 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 he's just unable to con convince Ahab to change his mind about anything. And then he says, he asks, you know, at least be forbearing. Uh, try to understand each other. Ahab seized a loaded musket from the rack, pointed it towards Starbuck and exclaimed, there is one God that is Lord over all the earth and one captain that is Lord over the Pequod on deck. I mean, he's, he's, he's really almost, uh, well, we knew that he was a Democrat in relation to the gods. Uh, he's, he's really elevating himself. He's, he's at a point that uh, the Greeks would call this a word hubris, that is demonstrating extreme pride, pride that uh, is beyond uh, what a man should be claiming for himself. Um, Starbuck responds, Thou hast outraged, not insulted me, sir, sir, but for that I ask thee not to beware of Starbuck. Thou wouldst but laugh, but let Ahab beware of Ahab. Beware of thyself, old man. And then he leaves. And then this is the thought of, of Starbuck, I mean of Ahab. He waxes brave, but nevertheless obeys. Most careful bravery that. And then they part ways. Any comments about this? Ahab completely misses that Starbuck is saying, Ahab, you are the problem. That's you are, right. You are, you are the danger. And Ahab completely misses it, just thinks, well, he, you know, he's, he, he's, uh, he's being a, you know, kind of forthright and, uh, and brave, and so that, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Starbuck is, uh, you know, I think their main issue is, uh, well, yeah, uh, that, Ahab is, uh, you know, going to go after Moby Dick regardless right. of anything. Right. Where Ahab looks at the bigger picture and says, you know, there's uh, investments at stake. There's people. Oh, you mean Starbucks is doing that? Yeah. Exactly. Or Starbuck. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, yeah. Starbuck. Uh, money, you know, investments, lives. I mean, you know, he's thinking about his wife and his boy later on. Um, yes. You know, yes. He brings up Africa. family. You'd think that that would move his heart. Because Ahab does rely strongly on his feelings, but the feelings of family were not enough to convince him to change his mind, right? And it, it, did Ahab have a, you know, it's, as I, if I read it correctly, he married, uh, spent just enough time with his wife to get her pregnant, and then left. That happened a lot with the shepherd, the whalers, yes, yes. Uh, on, on Nantucket, uh, there were a number of wives that became very um, independent souls because their husbands were gone so long and they had to manage their household. But often, but, yeah, they would, uh, the ship, the sailors would come home long enough to get uh, their wives impregnated and then they'd be gone for two years or three years. But, but Ahab did have a wife, correct? Yes, he did. Yes, yes. Okay, which he probably, it, it sounded like maybe he spent maybe a year or two with her out of the 40 years he'd been sailing. I... <laughs> That's possible, right? That's possible, right? I think I think he married late. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It says he got married after age fifty. Okay. And some some recent novelist has written a book. Uh, it probably came out about ten years ago called Ahab's Wife, and and tells a story about uh, Nantucket. It's all fiction, historical fiction, I guess you'd call it, but uh, from the point of view of, of Ahab's wife. And now I want to go to the gilder. What what uh, what what does the gilder mean? What what is the title? Why is it called the gilder? Anybody figure that one out? Isn't that a form of money? Yeah, gilder, Dutch gilder. I think he's playing on that word because he has a Dutch background. He would be very much aware of gilder. But here it is reference to the sun, uh, because you see here um, there are. Let's see. This, uh, if you've got your book, you can open it up to about uh, the chapter 114, the Gilder. 
And again, we have this kind of easy opening. These are the times when in his whaleboat, the rover softly feels a certain filial, confident, land-like feeling toward the sea, that he regards it as much as flowery earth. And the distant ship revealing only the tops of her mast seems to be struggling forward, not through high rolling waves, but through the tall grass of a rolling prairie as when the Western immigrants' horses only show their erected ears while their mm -hmm. hidden bodies widely wade through the amazing verdure. He's, he's getting a feeling, remember we had the, the, the chapter on the Brit, I think, where he talks about the contrast between the land and sea and the land is a peaceful place and the sea is often very violent. Um, here he's, he's blending, he's, he's on, on, the, on the boat, he's on the sea, but he's having thoughts that, that remind him of, of calmer pastures. The long drawn virgin veils, the mild blue hillsides is over there, steals the hush, the hum. You almost swear that play weary children lie sleeping in their solitudes in some glad May time when the flowers of the woods are plucked. But he's what's what's gilded here is is the sun and the, and the sun shining on the bright sea so that the whole sea seems like a golden shimmery kind of place. And it's, a, and it's a false gilding because it's right right and and he says all this mixes and this mixture of being on the sea and thinking of land all this mixes with your most mystic mood so that the fact and fancy halfway meeting interpenetrate and form one seamless whole fact and fancy fact being the observable actual world around you and fancy being your imagination they are half meeting they interpenetrate and form one seamless whole and I, I, I've got some words. Well, I'll just show you how the, this word interpenetrate right here. Uh, you've got fact and fancy and you follow those arrows and you come way out down to the end of this thought. Let fancy oust fact. Let fancy um, oust memory. Let faith oust fact and fancy oust memory. Uh, there's a, I've got some lines <laughs> drawn uh, from Fact and fancy down here become, there's fancy here and fact here. And then the word faith um, goes up to faith right here. And, uh, and so he's, he's, he's making these connections. And another neat thing in here is that what I would call it, uh, an example of chiasmus. Chiasmus, you see this word here, I've got highlighted uh, with gray. It, it's a term, it's a literary term where you actually have words uh, crossing ways with each other is his example there. Calms crossed by storms, a storm for every calm. You get calm going one way, calm goes across one way and crossing it is a storm. You get you know, calm to calm, storm to storm, you get a crossways there. <clears throat> there. It's similar oh, yeah, to the <laughs> crossing yeah, here of fact and fancy. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a rhetorical uh, gem that he's put in front of our eyes here. Comments, Tom, or somebody? Yeah, some previous discussions, I just saw you had highlighted warp and woof. Yes. And I noticed that that occurs again in yes, some of the, in here. More, more towards the end. Yes, uh, yeah. It would yeah. be interesting, and you know, to, uh, given the technology now, to find out how many occurrences where warp and woof occur together. Oh, yeah, about we could easily that, find that. All you'd have to do is go to that online, online version yeah. of it and just uh, type in those words, and it would tell you how many times they appear. Yes, yeah. that's a theme right. in here. I think the, the whole fact that we got the very first chapter called Loomings, even though Loomings are, you know, an emergence of a phantom or a large thing, uh, there, there's also the loom of time that we got in that mat, uh, uh, mat make, mat making chapter. And so I think we've got in here a lot of thematic play with, with the notion of weaving and fate and free will. And also the whole notion of this is really a play. We're all doing our parts in the drama. Those things inter interweave as themes through this entire novel, I believe. What does Melville mean by warp and woof? Oh, warp and woof, those are weavy terms. Uh, okay. Let me, let me show you. We talked about this last time. Warp yeah, that's right. We did that last time. We looked at yeah, that. Yeah, let, right. let me go. <clears throat> Here we go. And when you're weaving, the, the, the warp is the, the, the necessity, the things that are unchanging that goes up and down. And then the weft is what goes back and forth is driven by the shuttle. That's the, the weft, another word for it is woof. That's where, in, these are weaving terms about warp and woof, okay? Okay. 
Yeah, I just searched it in my iPad and, and warp and woof together occur five times. Okay, together that. Okay, warp and woof it is it, not just one alone or two alone. Thank you. Right, thank I, you. I, I could do the other search, but they occur That's together five times. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and, let's see, we got the mixture here. Um, and then uh, we see repetitions here. <clears throat> Nor did such soothing scenes, however, temporary fail of at least as temporary an effect on Ahab. This is what, ah. a, this is what Ahab is seeing when he looks in the golden uh, looking in the sea. It's again, it's like the Daboon chapter. You're seeing the same thing, but you see different things. This is Ahab. Uh, but if, the, if these secret golden keys did not seem to open in his in him his own secret golden treasures, yet did his breath upon them prove but tarnishing. O glassy glades, O ever vernal endless landscapes in the soul, in ye, though long parched by the dead draught of earthly life, in ye men may yet roll like young horses in new mown clover. Again, reference to the horses going through the, the, the pasture just earlier. Uh, and for some few fleeting moments, feel the cool duel of life immortal in them. Would to God these blessed calms would last. This is Ahab saying this. But the mingled and mingling threads of life are woven by woof and warp. Calms crossed by storms. A storm for every calm. There's no steady retracing of progress in this life. And we do not advance through fixed gradations. And at one, and at last, uh, and at the last one pause. And then he's going through the life of man. And it's similar to um, Shakespeare in a play, As You Like It where he gets the seven ages of man. Uh, and I think he's very much aware of what Shakespeare did and he's trying to imitate here a uh, somewhat same, same thing. Talking about the life of man, this is seen through Ahab's eyes. Through infancy's unconscious spell, boyhood's thoughtless faith, adolescence doubt, the common doom, then skepticism, then disbelief, resting at last in manhood's pondering repose, if of if. But once again, gone through, we trace the round again and our infants, boys and men, and ifs eternally, where lies the final harbor whence we unmoor no more, in which, in what wrapped ether sails the world of which the weariest will will every weary wear, and all these W sounds, and the founding's father hidden. Our souls are like these or those orphans, those unwedded mothers die in burying them. The secret of their paternity lies in their grave, and we must there learn it. And then we get uh, Starbuck looking down and he's, he's saying lovely, loveliest unfathomable as other ever lovers saw in his young bride's eye. Tell me not of thy teeth teared sharks and thy kidnapping cannibal ways. And, and, and uh, then um, let, let faith oust fact, let fancy oust memory. I look deep down and I do believe. Stubb says, I am Stubb. And Stubb has his history, but here Stubb takes oath that he has always been jolly. I mean, it's so flat compared to what the others, what Starbuck has, has said and what we had uh, an effect that's that on Ahab. Anyway, this is just some of the richness, the layering of, of, of images and so on that we see in some of the, the, the uh, more poetic writings here. Um, then we're back to watching for the whales. Um, I'm jumping ahead to the whale watch and Ahab has a dream. And he's close to uh, the Parsi, the Parsi is his, his harpooner. And the Parsi is able to interpret dreams supposedly. And so startled from his slumbers, Ahab's face to face, he saw the Parsi and hooped around the gloom and gloom, those, again, a kind of almost poetic assonance of those, those things. Um, of the night, they seemed like the last men on a flooded world. I dreamed it again, said he, of the hearses. Have I not said, old man, that neither hearses nor coffin can be thine? This is, Parsi says to, to Ahab, if you're dreaming about hearses, you're not going to be, don't worry about a hearse. You're not going to have to worry about a hearse or a coffin because the Parsi in his mind thinks, thinks he knows uh, what the end of a I I Ahab will be. Ahab responds, and who are hearsed that die in the sea, right? If you die in the sea, you're not going to be hearsed. Ooh. 
But I said, O oh man, that ere, that is before you can die on this voyage, two hearses must verily be seen be, by thee on the sea. Before you die, you're going to see two hearses on the sea. Hmm. The first not made by mortal hands. And the visible wood of the last one must be grown in America. He's given him a riddle. He's Parsi is giving the future of Ahab to him in a riddle. Aye, aye, strange cool. sight that, Parsi. Go ahead, comment, question? Yeah, and, uh, you know, seeing this, it's, it's kind of biblical in the sense that, you know, he's a prophet for uh, predicting the death of Jesus. And, who is? Uh, who's, who's, who's a prophet that predicting the death of Jesus? Well, who, uh, uh, who's saying, who said, but I said, old man, not uh, could earth die? Oh, the, the Parsi. It's like a the prophet. Parsi is saying, he's talking to Ahab. and uh, Yeah, he's, 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 he's prophesizing Ahab's death. That's right. That's right. And it's kind of like a, uh, you know, a, a writer in the Old Testament prophesying the death of Christ. Perhaps. Saying, you, know, you will see this, you will see this happen and before you die. Okay. And, okay. and actually, okay. When, you, when you get to the end, you saw what the Parsi prophesied yeah. came true. Right. And I think in the New Testament, Jesus sort of uh, prophesies in advance that, that you know, he, you don't, if, when you say you want to follow me, you, you don't know all, that, know all it's going to cost. You really follow me because I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to have to die at some point. And that kind of thing. Yeah. There's a, there's a kind of looking forward here, a prophesying that's going about. Um, let's see if I can get back where we were here. Um, yep. You're going to have, a, there'll be a hearse and its plumes floating over the ocean and with the waves of the, for the pallbearers. Anyway, how can you believe this? Believe it or not, you can't die until it be seen, old man. Um, so you're, you're going to stay alive until you see a hearse of some sort. And, uh, and Ahab can't quite believe this is kind of ranting and raving by this uh, Parsi. The Parsi, his name is, is uh, Fidala, uh, has in it the word Allah, the word that is used for God among uh, Muslims. And uh, the, the food part in front, Fides, uh, is related to the word uh, like uh, Semper Fidelis, that means always, uh, always faithful. Um, motto of the Navy, I think, or the Marines. Uh, the, the, the combination of fit and, and dala, fit dala, uh, it means Islamic faith in some way by the name of, of this uh, Parsi. Uh, yeah. uh, let's see. Go yeah. ahead. Excuse me, Judy, to yeah. interrupt, but. Sure, uh, go ahead. What, what chapter are you in? Oh, I'm chapter is uh, chapter 117, the Whale Watch. The whale watch because I got to the end, to the very end, and remembered the prophecy, but I couldn't remember where it was to go back. Ah, okay, yeah, right. And I'll I'll explain things toward the end too, how that all works out. We'll be we'll get there in just about a minute. Okay, um, very good. Thank Judy, you. This prophecy is reminiscent also of Shakespeare's uh, prophecy of Macbeth's death, where where there was, he would he, he would he would. Uh, he would die where he, he believed he could not die because he he was going to be slain by someone not of woman born and uh and that burnham wood would advance he said these things can't happen right so he's leaning on shakespeare here and also uh it's a it's, it's in the uh, odyssey uh in homer's odyssey you have a character cassandra it's in the iliad and odyssey she's in both um where she's a prophetess but nobody her 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 fate is that nobody would ever believe her, but all of her prophecies would come true. So there's this kind of weaving through the epic uh, literary tradition, including Shakespeare, you know, about prophecies and, and being unbelieved. Uh, not, and not are they going to be true or not? That, that, that question behind things. Um, let's see. Uh, Believe it or not, thou canst not die till it be seen. That is that uh, that uh, that hearse. And what was that saying about thyself? Though it come to the last, I shall go before thy pilot. Though it though it come to the last, I shall go before thy be thy pilot. That is. Uh, somebody's phone ringing. I hope it's not mine. Could you turn off uh, whoever's she's, phone ringing? Turn you mute yourself. Yeah, she's muted now. Okay. Um, Parsi says, I'm going to go before thee. Uh, I shall go, go before thee, thy pilot. That 
That is, in effect, the Parsi is going to say, I'm going to die before you are, and I'm going to be the pilot for you as you go through the process of dying. And, and Ahab, it doesn't, it doesn't sink in. And when, when, and when thou art so gone before, if that ever befall, then before I can follow, you must still appear to me to pilot me still. Was it not so? Well, then, did I believe all you say, oh, my pilot, I have here two pledges that I, I shall yet slay Moby Dick and survive it. Um, take another pledge, old man," said the Parsi. <laughs> that your view of it is not likely to happen, but my view is. That in effect is what he's saying. Um, and he says he concludes, "Hemp only can kill thee." Oh, the galleys, you mean? I'm immortal then, because on land and sea, um, immortal on land and sea. I'm I, I, only only hemp can kill me. He's not thinking about the hemp that, of course, is a part of the line that attaches the harpoon to the to the uh to the whale both were silent again as one man the gray dawn came on the slumbering crew rose from the bo boat's bottom and before noon the dead whale was uh brought the dead whale was brought to the ship i'm not sure what this is about but i do want to say that the first hearse is uh, looking ahead the first hearse is uh moby dick that's one uh the first hearse was uh not made by mortal hands. Moby Dick was not made by mortal hands. The second one, the visible wood that must be grown in America, that hearse is, of course, the Pequod. And the hemp is the hemp of the harpoon line that, in effect, is how Mo uh, Ahab gets entangled and dies. So looking from what we know, at the, having read the whole thing, looking back at this, you see that uh, the Parsi really and his predictions was pretty close to the truth, even though it was rather mystifying to the way he expressed it in these indirect symbolic ways of hearse and hemp. Then we get uh, moving forward here. We, we see, uh, I think from the point of the quadrant on that there are parts where Ahab is losing things. The Pequod is losing things. Uh, people on board the ship are losing are on their whale boats are losing their harpoons and their, uh, their, their various pieces of equipment. Um, this is what a quadrant looks like. It's used by uh, mariners to sort of figure out where they are uh, in, in the sea. See, it's not always that reliable. It relies on focusing on a sun. When we're looking at the sun is hard to see to begin with. It's bad on the eyes. But, but when you angle that, your, your angle between where you are in the sun and then this plumb line drops down and there are some numbers here. Uh, it, it was an aid, a primitive aid for sheep, ships to do navigation. But we get the Ahab in his response to this quadrant. He mutters, foolish toy. Babes plaything for haughty admirals, commodores, and captains. The world brags of thee of thy cunning and might. But what, after all, canst thou do but tell but poor, poor pitiful point uh, where thou hast happens to be on this wide planet? And the hand that holds thee, no, not one jot more. Thou canst not tell one drop of water where one drop of water or one grain of sand will be tomorrow noon. So he says, okay, it tells you where you are, but because it, you, it can't tell you where you will be, it's not that helpful to him. And he wants to, he wants something that will tell him where is the whale, and the, the the quadrant can't do that, and he gets upset. So he says, "Science, curse thee, thou vain toy, and cursed be all these things that cast man's eyes aloft to that heaven, whose vivid, vivid whose live vividness but scorches them, as those old eyes have even been scorched now with thy light. O sun, level by nature to this earth's horizon are the glances of man's eyes." Uh, curse the quadrant. He stomps on it. He breaks it. He doesn't want it. He, 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 he's, he's in effect, what, it, what little science is involved in the way the quadrant works, he is uh, abandoning science, so to speak, in this in a very um, physical way. And then we get the musket chapter. Um, Remember in an earlier chapter that there was a confrontation that Starbuck wanted to convince Ahab not to go after the whale, but to, to, to go back with all their oil and, and, and profit from it. Um, and earlier Ahab silenced him. Um, let's see. 
And then later, um, Ahab is in his room and probably sleeping and Starbuck comes by and he sees this musket and we get in chapter 123, the thoughts that go through his mind as he is uh, considering what he could do. He could, at this point, murder Ahab and take over the ship and send it home with a fairly decent set of oil barrels uh, and, and, and make a profit. He's thinking that this which goes through his mind. Strange that I, who have handled so many deadly lances, strange that I should shake now. Shake so now, load it. He's got this, this musket in his, his hands, uh, or he's thinking about putting it in his hands. Load it, I must see. I, I, and the power in the pan. Oh, this, that's not good. Best not spoil it. Wait, I'll cure myself of this. I'll hold the musket bo boldly while I think. I come to report a fair wind to him, but how fair? Fear for death and doom? That's fair for Moby Dick. It's a fair wind that's not, that's only fair that, for that accursed fish. The very tube, this very tube he pointed at me, this very one, this one. So he's, he's got the musket in his hands. He's wondering, I could, I could change things considerably if I kill Ahab at this point. I hold it here. He would have killed me with the very thing I handle now when he made that threat, when Ahab threatened Starbuck. And he would fain kill all his crew does he not say that he will not strike his spars to any gale? Has he not dashed his heavenly quadrant? He's broken his quadrant. And in these same perilous seas gropes he not his way. Just jumping ahead. Ha, ah, he's muttering in his sleep. Yes, just there, in there he's sleeping, sleeping. Aye, but still alive and soon awake again. I cannot withstand thee then, old man. Not reasoning, not remonstrance, not entreaty, wilt thou hearken to all this thou spornest, flat obedience to thine own flat commands. But is there no other way, no lawful way? Make him a prisoner to be taken home. What, hope to wrest this old man's living power with, from his own living hands? Only a fool would try it. What then remains? The land's hundreds of miles away and locked Japan the nearest. I stand alone here upon an open sea with two oceans and a whole continent between me and law. Aye, aye, to so. Is heaven a murderer when its lightning strikes a would-be murderer? Mm -hmm. Dead, tendering sheets and skin together, that is, in effect, melting them together. And would I be a murderer then if, and slowly, stealthily, and half sidewise, glut looking, he placed the loaded muskets in against the door. So we get his thoughts here, um, soliloquy again. Uh, and he puts it back again. He, he, he cannot, he cannot, he doesn't have it in him to, to murder Ahab at this point. Of course, if he had done it, he would have saved. That's right. And, and, and the entire rest of the crew. That's and, right. That's right. He didn't have long to really uh, <laughs> regret that, unfortunately, um, as we know at the very end. But yeah, this is the chance where by a decision on his part, he could have influenced, uh, it could have turned around the outcome of this whole voyage. Yeah. Question? Yes. Somewhere I got the idea, I don't know if it was from a, a movie or what, but I thought there was a mutiny on, on board the ship. Did that- not on, this, not on this ship. There, there was a, a, book, a, a movie called Mutiny on the Bounty. Yeah. That, that's maybe what you're thinking about. That's when a, a ship's crew, and, and it happens a number of times, I think, where a ship's crew had just had too much of a, of a tyrannical captain, and they would uh, mutiny. That is, they would uh, put the captain in chains or even toss him overboard and take over the ship. But that's not and, happening here. <clears throat> but but that, didn't ha that wasn't on the ship for Ahab and Starbuck are. That's correct. Mutiny on the Bounty describes a ship that that uh, actual, I don't know. It it, it was, it, it happened. It's it's not this boat. It's a different one. Okay. It's, it, right. So that brings up a very good point of why, since everyone knew that that Ahab was insane and leading them probably into doom, 
why they didn't mutiny. What Things kind of were behind him? What kind of hold did he have over them? Jean, did you have a comment? I think they were sort of behind him. They got all rubbed up when he gave them the speech. I don't. I, I think Starbuck was the only one who really caught on to his insanity. When mutiny was the, maybe. Maybe, maybe it was the gold balloon that settled it for them. <laughs> well, uh -huh. mutiny, mutiny was a capital offense too. It, you 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 couldn't mutiny without be without putting the life the, your life and those who cooperated with you know. Uh, at, at terrible risk. That's right. At some point, that mutinied ship would come to uh, t come to land or come to uh, claim whatever uh, rewards that the people on the boat were expecting for all their hard work. And when they realized the ship's captain was gone, there would be a trial and there would be justice wrought to some extent. And so it, 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 people who mutinied had to take the chance that uh, that they once they did get back safely on land, they might have to pay some consequences for their decision. And I think Jean brings up a good point, and that is there is such a, a mob spirit among the crew, their, their lust for the action of fighting the whales and so on, that, and we get this, uh, the, the image of wind will come up in just a few minutes uh, that, that captures this whole, uh, the spirit of the crew that is quite contrary to the caution that Starbuck wants to bring up. Any other comment before we go to the needle? They, they at some point are in a storm and the storm is so, so bad that at some point they realize, well, um, I'll, I'll go, well, let's look at the text here. I'm in chapter 124. And after, um, after the, the, the storm, the sea was as a crucible of melt, molten gold. Again, that Gildan sea idea. The sea was a, a crucible of <clears throat> molten gold that bubbling leaks up with light and heat. Ahab stood apart. And uh, ha ha, my ship, thou mightest well be taken now for the sea chariot of the sun. Ho ho, all ye nations before my prow, I bring the sun to ye. Uh, yoke on the further billows. Hello, a tandem. I drive the sea. This is bragging again. Ahab is saying, I'm the one that makes the sun rise in the morning. And uh, there was uh, a Greek myth uh, about Phaeton. Uh, he was the son of Helios. Helios is related to, to uh, is the god of the sun. Helios, uh, according to Greek myth, drives the chariot of the sun around the earth with his chariot. But one day his son Phaeton stole the chariot and caused chaos down the earth. And because um, the horses, he couldn't control the horses of that chariot. And Zeus struck Phaeton dead with a thunderbolt. So the Greek mythology. Um, but here, I think that um, Ahab is claiming the same kind of thing that he can control the sun. But suddenly, reined back by some counter thought, he hurried toward the helm, huskily demanding how the ship was heading. East, southeast, sir, said the frightened steersman. Thou liest, smiting him with his clenched fist. Heading east at this hour, this is morning, next morning, it says here up the top here, next morning. How can you be heading east at this hour in the morning and the sun is astern that is behind you? How can you be heading east in the morning and the sun is behind you? So he's causing the, to doubt the, their compass and, and he's already thrown away the quadrant. Now the compass is going and you can't trust it. Um, and so I, I think he's, the men on the ship at this point, I think are, are, are beginning to think that they're, they're, it's a disoriented awareness that they have. They're up is down, down is up uh, kind of thing, uh, the, right out of uh, Orwell's 1984. Um, but at this point... Uh, and, and Judy? Yes. Uh, the, the, if you back up just a tiny bit, the, the, every time the bowsprit dipped, he could see the sun. So they were heading east. They were heading toward the sun, but at the end, he says no. He said, "You know, the the sun is the sun is astern." Uh, if the, I, I, I'm not. I, I was confused by that. Why? I'm I think I, again, it's more crazy. of this confusion. Where's the sun? Yeah, heading east at this hour in the morning, and the sun is astern. But then uh, you've got the sun that uh, he 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 sees the bright rays ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh well, if the, if, the, if the sun was astern, that would mean that the sun was at the back of the boat. That's right, behind were, it. Yeah, they were going west. Right. right, but, but he, yeah, go ahead. 
because the because the storm had uh, disabled the needles of the compass. Right. So so you don't want to trust your compass. Okay. Let's see. The two compasses pointed east, and the Pequod was in fail to be going west. So the compasses are wrong, because because right. they, they they are going west. You see what we're doing here? I mean, this is like we're getting gaslighted by this by this. <laughs> this is a new term, gaslighting, where someone deliberately gets an opponent confused in order to to uh, lord it over them. And and we're we're this is a confused. It's told in a confusing way. And, and it, I'm sure that we're in some ways right now going through that same kind of confusion that the people on the board were doing it. Where this is, this is I think, part of the artistry of Melville at work. Um, so he's convinced the crew that the, the, the needles are, are wrong. The needles were exactly inverted. So he goes through this action that involved a lodestone or a magnet and a lance, an iron rod, and a thread. And he goes through some kind of hocus pocus and lo and behold, um, the, the compass got corrected. When it had been pointing west, it starts to point east after this. So uh, he, he sort of either has bamboozled his crew or he's done something that is that you can do and it does work, that you can fix a compass that's been thrown off kilter by a storm. Judy? Yes. Um the earlier when he, they clearly were heading they're heading east the bow was heading toward the sun then yes. he and ahab went to the back of the boat and, and he's saying i am the sun so how mm -hmm. can we be going east if if the sun is at the back of the boat is a stern and so again he, it, he, it's, he, it's, so it's, it's, i am the sun and i don't care what the compass says i am the right sun. <laughs> right <laughs> that's a little that's a little uh, extreme yeah right yeah. right Any other questions? I'm 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 sort of resting. I'm, I'm I'm my my compass is turning around here, and I I'm not sure if I can rely on Ahab at this point to be a good guide. Let's put it that way. Maybe yeah. that would be the safest statement to come out of this chapter with. And then we've got the log in line. This is a way to I think it was a way to determine what speed they were going or direction. There was some kind of thing that they would at various points throw out a log and then reel in the line and try to figure out where they were or what their speed was. I'm not sure the function of it, but having gotten rid of his quadrant and not sure maybe totally with everybody about whether the compasses were working, he was gonna try the, the log in line technique. So he uh, gets the log in line out. And uh, I think one of the people on, on, the, uh, on the ship said, well, I think some the Manxman, I don't know, one of them is, it heaves the log and he, and the, the 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 log instead of floating, it just simply drops down like it's a like it's a brick, and uh, it's it went go went down so fast that it even snapped the line that's supposed to be tied to it, and so they 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 lost the, that ability to use the log and line to to help them in their navigation, and here we've got. Uh, Ahab exclaiming, I, clus I crush the quadrant, the thunder turns the needles, and now the mad sea parts the log line. But Ahab can mend all. I can fix it. <laughs> I'm here. I'm in control. Yeah, Judy, that's like when he was looking at the coin and saying, I'm the, you know, I'm the mountain, I'm the whatever, oh, yes. I'm the whatever. That's right. That narcissism is <laughs> coming through here again also. Yes. Yeah, very, very clearly. Yes. And let's see what happens. Uh, Pip, <laughs> Pip, I think is excited about this log that went under, and uh, suddenly Pip disappears. Pip jumped from the whaleboat. Pip's mi missing. Uh, so said the Manx man. Uh, let's see now if you haven't fished him out yet. Fisherman drags hard. He's holding on. Jerk him, Tahiti. Jerk him off. That is somehow. Pip is overboard, and he, he's grabbed onto that line from that was tied to the log and uh, trying to get back on the boat again by means of that. And, and uh, some of the other cruisemen are, are debating about whether they want a coward like Pip to get uh, stay on board. We had that discussion with Stubb before as well. Uh, we haul no cowards here. Captain Ahab, sir, sir, here's Pip trying to get on board again. And, uh, but 
Um, this is where we, and I mentioned this last time too, that this is where we get a soft side of, of, of Ahab. He takes pity on Pip and he says, you know, in effect, Pip, bring him on board. I'm going to keep him in my cabin. I'm going to try to keep him safe. Pip is, he's an immortal soul. Uh, he says there, and, and who art thou, boy? I see not my reflection in the vacant pupils of thine eye. As I see not my reflection in the vacant pupils of thine eyes. Oh, God, that man should be a thing for mortals to soothe, to soothe through, through. Oh, man. Let's see. Oh, God, that man should be a thing for immortal souls to soothe through. Who art thou, boy? So he's expressing an idea about, um, and this is a Greek notion that, um, that souls are immortal. They, they just go through various bodies. Uh, after a body dies, uh, the soul goes to uh, a place of rest for a while, and then it gets assigned a new body. That, that souls are always immortal, but the body is is replaceable. Uh, an old Greek notion, um, and he's bringing that up in relation to Pip. Um, Let's see. Oh, you frozen heavens, look down here. He did beget this luckless child and have abandoned him. The creative libertines, here boy. Ahab's captain shall be Pip's home henceforth while Ahab lives. Thou touchest my inmost center, boy. Thou art tied to me by cords woven by my heartstrings. Come, let's down. What's this? Here's velvet shark skin intently gazing at Ahab's hand and feeling it. Ah, now, had poor Pip but felt so kind a thing as this, perhaps he had never been lost. This seems to me, sir, is a man rope, something that weak souls may hold by. Oh, sir, let old Perth, one of the crewmen, now come and rivet these two hands together, the black one with the white, for I will not let this go. Uh, it's almost like that same kind of bond that we had earlier in, in our very first week, four weeks ago, uh, between uh, Queequeg and Ishmael, that the bond of friendship got bond here between Pip and Ahab being expressed. Oh boy, nor will I thee, unless I shall thereby drag thee, drag thee to worse horrors than are here. Well, that will happen. Come into my cabin, lo, ye believers in God's all goodness and all Man, all ill, lo, you see the omnipresent present gods, oblivious to see the omni, uh, see the omniscient gods, oblivious to suffering man. See the omniscient gods, oblivious to suffering man. His his idea about God is that God uh, is oblivious to the to what goes on on earth. And man, though idiotic and knowing not what he does, yet full of the sweet things of love and gratitude. Come, I feel prouder leading thee by thy black hand than though I gasped, grasped an emperor's. And then the commentary of the Manxmen. There go two daft ones now, one daft with strength and the other daft with weakness. Mm. Yeah. See the omniscient gods oblivious of suffering man. Um, that's the expression and the view I think I would get from Ahab. I'm, I'm wondering at the end, and maybe we can have time to talk about this. Um, what, it, what is the view of God that is expressed uh, in relationship to what happens on, 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 on earth and what happens specifically to the Pequod? I wonder what Ishmael thinks. I wonder what Melville thinks. And we get different points of view. And I guess like the doubloon and like the gilder, uh, different men would have a different way to um, explain that relationship about whether things are willed by God or if it's controlled more by chance or by human free will. Things to think about. Another thing that they lose, having lost the log, they go on and lose the life buoy. Uh, there is a, an occasion here where they... Um, it happened. It happens that, that sometimes people on the mast they get so caught up in their well. At sunrise, this man went out from his hammock to the masthead at the fore, and whether it was that he was not half wakened from his sleep, or sa sailors sometimes go aloft in a transition state. <laughs> whether it was thus with the man, there is now no telling. But be that as it may, he had not been long at his perch when a cry was heard, a cry and a rushing, and looking up. They saw a falling phantom in the air and looking down a little tossed heap of white bubbles in the blue of the sea. 
the life buoy, a long slender cask or uh, barrel was dropped from the stern where it always hung obedient to the cunning spring, but no hand rose to seize it. And the sun having long beat upon this cask that had shrunk and it was slowly filled and, and the, the parched wood also filled at every four and the studded iron bound cask followed the sailor to the bottom as if to yield him a pillow, to, to be a pillow for him. And this man is never named. And it's the first man I think to lose his life from this boat, the ship. And I would, I think it's strange that, he, that he's not named, but, and, and it may be somewhat that, uh, that Ishmael who's telling the story was not feeling all that close to the man to even think it's significant to name him at this point. It's, uh, it's, it's unusual that he wouldn't have a name, that you lose your first person and, and you don't even have a name for him. It's Part of a dehumanizing process of what they're going through, perhaps. Comments? It, it's confusing to me, too, that the guy falling from the masthead would fall into the water instead of on the deck. Uh, right. And, and I, I don't know if it's somehow is, is a, you know, I don't know, it, the, the whole circumstance seems so oddly invented. Yeah, yeah. And it, it could be that it, it, we don't get that much information as a context here about whether this is a peaceful time on the sea or whether it was yeah. really churning badly. Yeah. It would have to be churning pretty badly, I think, for a person to fall off and, and go directly into the sea. Good point. Yeah. Again, a little bit of confusion here. And then we get the Pequod meeting the Rachel. Uh, that's significant. Um, why, why, uh, what, what's the Rachel's concern when they get out, when they see each other, um, uh, they, they know, uh, at least, um, uh, it seems like Ahab knows that the Rachel, uh, is the ship that has left Nantucket. The name is familiar. And of course, Ahab's first question is, have you seen Moby Dick? That's all he's interested in. And the Rahel, Rachel answers, no, um, but have you seen, uh, a lost whaleboat? carrying perhaps uh, the son of the captain. And Ahab refuses to be delayed in his pursuit of Moby Dick and he goes on. Again, a little bit of that indifference to human life. We see that carried on. We saw that indifference to human life and the, the, the loss of that man that just drowned. And, and we're seeing it here, I think, in Ahab uh, and not willing to help the Rachel search for the captain's son. And the Rachel is uh, an allusion to a biblical character. Uh, there's reference to it in Jeremiah uh, somewhere and as, as well uh, in, in the New Testament. Uh, and it comes in Matthew at a time when Herod's killing all of the, the, the little babies, uh, two and under baby boys. And uh, one of the mothers of the baby of a baby is named Rachel. And it, it, he's, she's a, a symbol of, of all the women that, that mourn for the loss of, of their sons. Next thing that's lost. There's a, there's another Question. Judy about about the boats because they they earlier had met the bachelor another ship right and, and the bachelor said the captain said uh, that, that they somebody said they had seen the white whale but he didn't believe it then the okay. second the second one they mm -hmm. they, they saw and chased uh, uh, the white whale and the, and this and the son of the captain was lost in a boat and then the third one coming up is the one where uh, they not only not only saw and encountered the Moby Dick, but Moby Dick and caused the death of a whole bunch of people. So I've got, this is escalating. Yes, escalating. With Moby Dick as they get closer. Escalating losses. Yes, yes. Good point. Um, and then uh, in chapter 130, uh, Ahab loses his hat. How does he lose his hat? You know, anybody? <laughs> I don't remember that. A bird, uh, a hawk is circling around, spiraling downward. The word spiraled, uh, spiralized downward, it, it, it explains the vortex pro effect that we get at the very end of this book as well. Um, and it, the so Seahawk circled and swooped down, grabbed Ahab's hat, flew off with it, and later people from the boat see that the hat is dropped into the water, but it was lost never to be retrieved. Oh, uh, and actually back up just one before, the, while sure. Rachel's on this page, I yeah. was surprised to see Rachel ending up at the very last end of the book. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. things come around again. Yes, right. 
Uh, in the symphony, Starbuck pleads with Ahab to change course to go to back, back to Nantucket, but Ahab persists in pursuing uh, Moby Dick. And these are some of the words of, uh, of Ahab, of, no, of Starbuck. Oh, my captain, my captain, noble soul, grand old heart. After all, why should anyone give chase to that hated fish? And, and the words of oh, captain, captain, my captain, uh, mm -hmm. did they ring a bell with you from any other poem that you may have remembered from high school yeah. days? Yeah. Yeah, yeah which? About, about Lincoln, but I'm trying to remember it was, oh, captain, my captain, but it, uh, is, that, is that Longfellow? No, you're close though. Uh, it's it's uh, from a, a colleague. Uh, they he, they lived the same time. It's from Walt Whitman. Oh yeah. Okay. And uh, his poem, "Oh Captain, My Captain," is the title uh -huh. of the poem. And the poem was written after the death of Lincoln. And Lincoln uh, uh, died, of course, uh, in, in 1865. Well after this novel was written in 1851 and published in 1851. So uh, it wouldn't be uh, Melville. Uh, quoting Whitman, it would be perhaps Whitman mm -hmm. quoting either Melville, or maybe this was a common phrase, oh, captain, my captain, my captain, oh, my captain. Um, but it, it's possible. It's possible that uh, Walt, Walt Whitman had read Moby Dick and these lines had stuck in his memory. Yeah. And he used that as his uh, refrain. At each one of the three stanzas of his poem, uh, oh, captain, my captain, begin with that, oh captain, my captain, our fearful trip is done. Oh captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. My captain doesn't answer, his lips are pale and still, and then it goes on. I think I have a chance, I think later this week to uh, have uh, William Panapacker, who was an expert at Hope College on Walt Whitman. Uh, some of us maybe attended uh, his course a while back. I'm, I'm gonna try to ask him this week when I, when I am in that course before things get started, whether it's possible that Whitman could have been, could have read Moby Dick. Uh, they both are New Yorkers, uh, Whitman and um, and uh, and and um, Herman Melville. But I don't know that they ever crossed paths that much. They uh, Whitman was not that much into um, seagoing things as much as, of course, uh, Melville was. Anyway. Um, so he makes this plea about we've got family, we've got wife, we've got children and family at home and, uh, and Ahab's response, um, he takes no responsibility for his actions but claims that God and fate turns humans round and round in this world. Here he says, what is it? What nameless inscrutable earthly thing is it? What cousining or, or um, uh, tricking hidden Lord and master and cruel remorseless emperor commands me that against all natural lovings and longings, I keep pushing and crowding and jamming myself on all the time, recklessly making me ready to do what in my own proper natural heart, I durst not as much dare. Is Ahab, Ahab? Is it I? God or who that lifts this arm? But if the great sun move not by him, of himself, it is, is an errand boy in heaven. If he's claiming to be a son, then he's going to be claiming he's God's errand boy. Nor one single star can revolve, but by some invisible power. How then can this one small heart beat? This one small brain think thoughts, unless God does that beating, does that thinking, does that living, not I. By heaven, man, we are turned round and round in this world like yonder windless and fate is the hand spike. Now I had to look up some words here. A windlass is a barrel that winds or unwinds a cable around it in order to raise or lower an anchor. And, and a handspike is a lever or a handle on that barrel that men use to turn that windlass to wind or unwind the cable to which the anchor is attached. So he's saying by heaven, man, we are turned round and round like a bear, we're, we're like a barrel um, and, and we're, we're like a, a, a barrel that gets turned around and round and uh, what, what is the handle on that is something called fate. And uh, again, he's refusing to take responsibility, I think, at this point by saying, I'm, I'm too little. Uh, it, it, it has to be God that's making me do this. It's not the devil made me do it. It's God made me do this. <laughs> this is Ahab. Um, then we get the chase the first day. Ahab 
in his whaleboat, takes the lead. And he gets so close that he's, his mouth is, Moby Dick's mouth, it comes within a foot of Ahab's head. And Moby Dick bites Ahab's boat in two and Ahab with his crew falling into the sea. Uh, they fall into the sea, but they're rescued. And the Pequod, the, 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 the Pequod sails between Moby Dick and the swimming men. Uh, and uh, from, from Ahab's splintered boat. That's the first day. So uh, they, they just, uh, Ahab is, is very close to the whale and he could have lost his life, but he didn't. He's preserved because the, under, the Pequot intervenes between that, that boat and, and, uh, and the whale. The next day, uh, they lost some damaged whale boats. They lost oars and harpoons. They lost Ahab's harpoon. Moby Dick has snapped to splinters Ahab's ivory leg and the Parsi Fadala is missing. That bothers Ahab because he realizes that the Parsi had suggested that he would die before Ahab would. But now that the Parsi's dying dead, uh, Ahab is thinking, well, maybe there might be more to that prophecy than he first thought. And uh, Star Starbuck pleads and Ahab persists. Ahab says, the hand of fate has, this is uh, the, the second day, the hand of fate has snatched all of her soul, all their souls. And by their stirring perils of the previous day, the rack of the past night's suspense, the fixed, unfearing, blind, reckless way in which their wild craft went plunging it toward its flying mark by all these things their hearts were bowled along that their hearts that is the hearts of all the crew as um gene had mentioned the crew are really caught up in this the wind that made great bellies of their sails of the ship sails and rushed the vessel on by arms invisible and irresistible uh, it, it, it's it's a, the fate is like a wind that is driving things uh, this seemed that his fate and the wind seemed to be the symbol of that unseen agency which so enslaved them to the race, that is the race to, to uh, get to, uh, to Moby Dick and to, to kill Moby Dick. So enslaved them. I like that word enslaved. Again, he's using a word that is familiar in his culture. Slavery was uh, in the air in the 1840s and 50s and it uh, led to the Civil War in the 60s, 1860s. Um, they couldn't find the Parsi, um, and uh, let's see. Starbuck is saying, great God, but for one single instant, show thyself, cried Starbuck. Starbuck is pleading to God. Never, never wilt thou capture him, old man. In Jesus' name, no more of this. This is worse than devil's madness. Two days chase, twice stove, to, twice stove to splinters. Thy very leg once more snatched from under thee. Thy evil shadow gone, all good angels mobbing thee with warnings. What more wouldst thou have? Shall we keep chasing this murderous fish till he swamps the last man? Shall we be dragged by him to the bottom of the sea? Shall we be towed by him to the infernal world? Oh, oh, impiety and in blasphemy to hunt him more. And... Uh, Star, uh, smart, and, star and, and Ahab responds, in effect, he's saying, fool, I am the fate's lieutenant. I act under orders. Look, thou underling, that thou obeyest mine. And so he's still the absolute tyrant here. Um, and uh, he's driving him on. We get the third day. Uh, sharks, for the first time, are following around the whale boat uh, and biting big pieces from the oars of the whale boat. A hawk tears away at the ship's flag. Ahab's harpoon line snaps and he's strangled by it. Moby Dick stoves the Pequod and all go down. Any comments? I know this went fast. Well, again, the, a, hawk, a hawk took Ahab's hat and now a hawk's trying to take the ship's flag. They're kind of symbolically the same thing. I don't know exactly what it means. They're, 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 no, well, no, 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 no. In, 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 yeah, on that third day, um, the sh ship's flag was taken and Tashchigo was going up on the mast to install a new flag. And as the ship is going down, he grasps that flag and somehow the bird that was going to take away the flag is 
is, no, is no. brought down with, within the flag, kind of strangled it within that flag and the whole business goes down. Mm -hmm. the, sh the, flag, the ship goes down, the flag goes down, the bird encased in, 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 in shrouded by that flag goes down as well. That, that's what I picked up on in that, uh, the third day of the chase. So then we get the epilogue. The drama's done. Again, we get that merging of fate, free will, necessity, chance, and then the dramatic terms is, you know, we're all parts in a play here. The drama's done. Why then? Here does anyone step forth? Because one did survive the wreck. It's so chanced. Chanced. Chance is the thing that makes the variable within the weaved mat. That is the Chance was uh, symbolized by Queequeg's uh, sword going back and forth within the loom each, between each woof going past and uh, makes that, it, it was chance that, that helped to make that, uh, that, that mat. So a chance that after the Parsi's disappearance, I was he whom the fates ordained to take the place of, Ad, of Ahab's bowman, bowsman. Uh, so, we know that the Adams, um, Ahab's harpooner was the Parsi named Fadala. Fadala, of course, was killed. The, he got tied up and tangled in, in Ahab's line earlier. And to take the place of that person on Ahab's boat was none other than Ishmael. So Ishmael is on the boat, on the, on the little whale boat with Ahab at this point. So when the boat uh, let's see. I was he whom the fates ordained to take the place of Ahab's bo bozeman when the bozeman assumed the vacant post. Um, so uh, in order, the bozeman was, was, um, was Fidala, and that's, that's vacant now. And so uh, Ishmael is, is in the boat with, with Ahab at the very end. There are many people on, on, the, on the ship. And if you read that, the, the third day of the chase, uh, on, on the Pequod itself uh, was Starbuck. And Ahab always wanted Starbuck to be uh, stay on the ship, don't go in the whale boats uh, when they're chasing Moby Dick. Also on the ship was Tashtigo and Dagu, the th three um, uh, of all of the mates were on the ship. Um, and so, and, and Queequeg was on the ship, I think, as well. So it was unfortunately, well, fortunately, <laughs> Ishmael was with Ahab on the, on the, on the whale boat. So anyway, back to here again. Um, I don't understand why they automatically died when they went down with the ship. Couldn't anyone swim? Because you think someone, they'd swim for a while. And I think that boat, when it went down, it caused a vortex. Uh, and maybe mm. we can get to that point. Let me see here. It, um, it's, it's, just, that, it's just the sentence above round and round. Okay, here we are. Let me go round and round. Uh, let's get uh, three men were tossed out from the rocking boat. Uh, let's see. On the last day, the three men were tossed from out the rocking boat, was dropped astern. So floating on the margin of the ensuing scene, here we are. Ishmael's floating. The, uh, the other people that are on on uh, Ahab's boat, they're 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 trying to their best to swim for for life. Um, and Ahab and uh, Ishmael is, is floating off in the margins, um, floating in the margin on the ensuing scene and in full sight of it, when the half spent suction of the sunk ship re reached me, I was then but slowly drawn toward the closing vortex, the closing vortex. It's sort of like the water when you're draining a bathtub, you know, it goes around and around. And it becomes, it's a, it's a pressure that can't be refused. What happened was when that boat went down, there was great suction and caused a, a, a swirling of waters all around it. So no matter how well these men could, sh could swim, uh, or, or perhaps they were even hanging onto a, a boat or a big board, it, it still ended up drowning and pulling them all down with them. Hmm. When I reached it, it had subsided to a creamy pool, round and round then, and ever contracting toward the button-like black bubble at the axis of the slowing, slowly wheeling circle like another Ixian I did revolve. Um, till gaining that vital center, the black bubble upward burst and now liberated by reason of its cutting spring and owing to its great buoyancy, rising with great force, the coffin life buoy shot lengthwise from the sea, just got shot up and fell over and floated on by my by side. 
buoyed up by that coffin for almost one whole day and night, I floated on a soft, a soft and dirge-like mane. The unharming sharks, they glided by as if with padlocks on their mouths. The savage seahawks sailed with sheathed beaks. And on the second day, a sail drew, drew near, nearer and picked me up at last. It was the devious cruising Rachel that in her retra retracing search after her missing children only found another orphan. And how this is how it ends, another orphan. And he was rescued by, by the Rachel. And another one of the ironies that are built so much within the book. Yes, go ahead, Anne. Is that the um, the life boy was lost when that one sailor first died, and then Queequeg's coffin. Uh, so replaced well replaced the life boy. Replaced the life boy, yeah. and yes. who knows? You know, if it had been a plain life boy, maybe it wouldn't have saved him. But the the wonderful coffin. Uh, so carefully made at Queequeg's request uh, saved him. Right, and so the the, the friendship, it, it, it's you know it's almost like Queequeg was giving part of his friendship here if you can figure that out. But yeah, yeah, saved by a coffin, <laughs> definitely an irony. Any other comments about about the novel at this itself? I want to say something about the, the history of the publication. There were two editions. The first one came out in, in Britain, uh, in England, and it was titled The Whale, and it came out in October 1851. That edition did not have the epilogue, and so the reviewers said, you know, how can we have a story when we don't have a survivor? And they all went down. And so Melville quickly rewrote, <laughs> he wrote an Ooh. epilogue for this book, and in the American edition called Moby Dick, that was added. Another thing that the British did in their edition, they had the entomology, etymology and extracts. They had that at the very end instead of at the beginning. And uh, he, uh, Melville went back for his American edition to put those at the beginning as he had intended all along. <clears throat> now, these books did not sell well. Uh, only, uh, let's see, only 300 sold in, uh, in the first four months and he um in the american version there were almost 3,000 copies printed uh 125 review copies given away to reviewers about 100 1,500 sold in 11 days but then sales slowed very much um and and then there was a fire in the the publisher's place in the warehouse another 30 got got um burned and so uh, his book was not popular, and it wasn't until the 20th century, after uh, scholars found uh, a book called Billy Budd, uh, a novella that became popular. And Billy Budd was about a ship's mutiny, and uh, that brought Millsville, Melville's uh, back into the attention of literary scholars and critics. And uh, later in the 20th century, after we saw in World War II the rise of of uh, Mussolini and Hitler, uh, I think a lot of people realize that that in some ways Ahab represent or it prefigured a, a lot of some of the tyrants that we've had in the 20th and 20th century and 21st century, and uh, there was great readership um, in it in, in, in all of the 20th century toward especially 1950 on. Melby Dick was recognized as one of great one of the great uh, novels and if not epics of America. Uh, and uh, and he's he's become acknowledged as a sort of America's uh, America's Dostoevsky because he does probe the whole notion of of the heart of man and evil and the relationship of of, of God and and man in the world uh, those fate free yeah. will those kind of questions yes go ahead Judy yes uh, for those who might be interested uh, <clears throat> Benjamin Britten. Uh, prominent c composer of England, wrote an uh, uh, opera based on Billy Budd. An and, opera based on Billy Budd. Okay. Yeah, and it, it, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful opera. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Any comments, questions? I, I, we're reaching close to the end of our time together. Uh, 
<laughs> I, at one time, it, I thought of maybe having this be a five session course rather than four, but I thought, can I have people live with Moby Dick for five weeks? Or how many people would be interested in taking a five week class on this? So I reduced it to four and you can tell from my pace that um, I'm trying to cram as much as I can into the four weeks. I appreciate what? your patience. Go ahead. I just want to thank you for you did well. um, you did thank you so much. your commentary as well and, and, and keeping, keeping this, uh, this pace up. It was very good. Thank you. Yep. And thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. And, yes, Judy, and Judy, if you have a moment, I wanted to share with you, I have a different edition than what you have with notes by Carl Hovde. Okay. And he has very interesting uh, discussion of Melville's style, mm -hmm. which as I read the book, it just made so much sense. And the, there were three styles. The first one um, was um, neutral, straightforward expo exposition. Okay. Uh, such as where he's describing the cutting in or all of the um, aspects of the uh, the actual uh, hunting and killing of the whale. Okay, uh, the, the blubber parts and right. try works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second and most frequent tone is one we hear uh, is uh, the narrator, uh, yes. Ishmael's uh, uh, personality, uh, his jaunty, half-joking way of entertaining. But the third one, I thought, was very well described. It's what one can call the American sublime, a high extravagant, and, and we've been reading this all along, all four weeks we found these places. Yes. A high extravagant rhetoric designed to sweep us away in an emotion-charged thought. And he goes on to say, and I'll just leave it with this, is that, that this is a dangerous mode because it's very easy for it to become what we might call purple prose. Mm -hmm. but Melville, right. Yes. And, and this evidently Melville fell into this with his third novel, Marty. But um, in Moby Dick, uh, I, I never found it anything but um, kind of awesome. Okay. Great. Did your cat like the book? Yes. Uh, she loves fish. <laughs> 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 that's wonderful. <laughs> and, oh, that's good. And you should see her when I'm taking a Zoom exercise class. She takes part in it too. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. We, we're glad that we could have your cat along. What's your cat's name? Uh, Boston Blackie. Okay. It's Other, black otherwise cat. known as BB. Okay. Very good. <laughs> very good. Um, oh, any God. any other comments uh, from anyone? Yeah. Great class. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Judy. Uh, yeah. You've done a wonderful and, job. Yeah. And okay, well, also, Marcella, can I just say I miss you? It's been so nice to see you in this class. Yeah, yeah. We were, we were pool mates at Evergreen. Ah, okay. That's when, right. you, when, when will you be able to get back into the pool there at Evergreen? You have any idea? I, I have been going. They opened it up um, in the fall with okay. very big restrictions. And that's actually why I come in late and eating lunch with the, myself, my view black, uh, because I go in the pool until about uh, noon. Wow, that's a great preparation for Moby Dick, all that swimming. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for all joining in and uh, I appreciate your comments and uh, we look forward to seeing each other in other classes in the future. You bet. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank 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 you.